Okay, recording. And we will have this posted probably on the Baton Rouge Audubon Society Facebook page as well as YouTube shortly after the presentation. If you can't stick around until the end or you want to share this with somebody who was not able to attend at the live um, time. Let me double check. So I think that is really it for just kind of general housekeeping. Um, for those who haven't met me before, I am Katie Percy. So I've been sending out the program announcements uh, on our listserv and posting them on the Baton Rouge Audubon Society Facebook page as well. So if ever you have a recommendation for a presentation for this uh, chapter, please do get in touch with me and I'd be more than happy to try to coordinate uh, for future presentations. So we're booked for this month, obviously, October and November as well. We will, and so this kind of kicks off our fall presentation series and then we'll kick, um, and then we take a break in December and we'll be back in January for the spring session. And I still have to um, schedule those out, but we are scheduled for the rest of the fall presentations. Okay, well, without further ado, let me go ahead and officially introduce our presenter for tonight, Juita um, Martinez. She is a third year PhD student at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And Juita, I believe that's in Paul Lieberg's lab, yes? Yes. Okay, I did mean to double check with you about that. Um, and Juita is studying brown pelicans in coastal Louisiana, which is why we have invited her here to present to us tonight. So with that, I will go ahead and turn my video off, let you screen share and take it away. Cool, thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Let me go ahead and add before I um, mute myself. Of course, you can type questions into the chat and then I will come back on and read those out loud to you, Juita, to answer at the end of the presentation. Same thing on the Facebook page, type questions in there and I will also pick those up and read them out loud after you finish presenting. Cool, sounds good. Can everyone see my screen, is it okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I know most people are probably from Louisiana, um, but I'm going to go through um, kind of my story of how I ended up here. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, California. So to me, Louisiana was, kind of Mardi Gras. That's what I knew about it. That's what I'd heard about it. I was thinking it was Mardi Gras and just swamps. <laughs> and I was like, both things I was excited about. I was very excited to see all the wildlife that was here. Um, and I found brown pelicans, which is what my dissertation research is on. And um, there's a bunch of little gems here as well. So as most of us know, the brown pelican is a huge symbol for the state of Louisiana, including being the state bird. Um, it's on the state flag. We also have a basketball team named after it. And the brown pelicans are seen as a symbol of hope and a symbol of resilience, especially because we are losing so much land here. And there's always something going on. <laughs> So coastal areas such as coastal Louisiana are so highly valued due to their diverse and resource rich habitat. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of people that live on the coastline, including Grand Isle. My advisor did not warn me about what I would find when I first drove down to Grand Isle. And for those of us who are not from Louisiana, um, the houses look like this. They're basic, it's basically a town on stilts. And I thought this was the most genius idea. Um, and the reason why they're on stilts is to help prevent the houses from being flooded um, during any storm surges. Um, Grand Isle is actually 10 minutes from my field site, which is Queen Bess, um, which I will talk about a little bit in a few minutes here. And something that I see often when I'm out doing my field work um, with the brown pelicans is shrimp boats, as well as oil platforms. And these are just some of the examples of how many resources we have here in Louisiana. 
Um, unfortunately, with all of these resources, there are a lot of human wildlife conflicts, such as oil leaks, not even spills, just the leaks that happen because we're drilling for oil down here. And it makes, it creates this vulnerable, like, um, uh, this vulnerable atmosphere for pelicans and other animals that utilize our coastline. So in order to talk about the present, I'm just gonna talk about the past for a little bit. Um, in the 1940s, DDT was widespread um, here in the United States. It was sprayed on water to eliminate mosquito larvae, which would be taken up then by algae and then passed on to other consumers. Um, and upon entering our coastal waterways, the DDT had actually been absorbed by anchovies and other fish, such as menhaden, which is the favored um, prey for brown pelicans. I think a lot of us know about the bald eagle story, but not everyone may necessarily know about what happened to the brown pelicans concerning DDT, because as DDT makes its way up the food chain, it becomes more concentrated. So just to give everyone a little bit of background story, in 1919, there was an estimated 50,000 individuals here in Louisiana, which is a lot of brown pelicans, and I wish I could see it now. <laughs> um, in 1938, there was an estimated only 5,000 individuals, um, which is a steep drop. And by 1961, there were no nesting pairs of brown pelicans left in the state. And let me remind you, the brown pelican is the state bird, and that's so sad. And actually by 1963, we had zero brown pelicans here in the state. So they were considered locally extirpated or locally extinct. But not to be all doom and gloom, I promise, this is not a doom and gloom presentation. Because with a joint effort between Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, we were able, not me, them, <laughs> um, they were able to start a translocation program where they brought juvenile pelicans that were born the same year from Florida at about 110 per year all the way to Louisiana. And they basically had to cross their fingers and hope that these pelicans came back to Louisiana every single year to establish a new population. And all of their hard work and effort really paid off because we now have brown pelicans here in Louisiana again. And by 2001, there were 16,000 nesting pairs here in Louisiana, which is pretty good when we started at zero in 1963. So if you're from Louisiana, you probably heard this uh, quite a few times, but we are in the midst of a coastal land loss crisis. And the reasons for this land loss is um, human caused as well as just natural things that happen on our coastline. And these human causes include our levees and our flood control structures. Unfortunately, they're really, really good for human lives and saving human infrastructure, but they're not great for letting sediment deposit where it would naturally do so on its own and therefore we're not having the normal land buildup that we would had we not had these structures um we also have the good old nutria invasive species um so in terms of ground nesting birds such as terns and skimmers um they could potentially predate on those eggs and even try to predate on brown pelican eggs, which we have yet to see, which is a good sign. And as if you're from here, we all know that we are not only um, not getting a ton of sediment deposition, but we're also sinking. There's quite a bit of subsidence here in Louisiana, which is not helping our land loss problem. In addition to the sea level rise, as well as tropical storms and hurricanes and storm surges. I really like this um, Crims map, which basically shows how much land we have lost since 1932. And that amount of land is about 1900 square miles, roughly the size of Delaware. And as you can see, all that land is now turned into open water. 
just to give everyone a little bit of an idea of where I work um, out in coastal Louisiana, these five arrows approximately show the barrier islands that I go to every single year since 2018. Um, and this animation is showing um, the amount of land loss that is predicted within the next 50 years if Louisiana doesn't do anything to stop it, such as restoration. Um, so we're projected to lose quite a bit of land if we just sit back and do nothing. But thankfully, positive, <laughs> thinking positive here, and the state of Louisiana is doing um, a lot of things to help mitigate our land loss issue. And unfortunately, um, barrier islands, which is where my mouse is pointing, they tend, they are the first to be lost if we do lose any land. Okay, so we have $21.4 billion, which has been secured um, since 2007 to help mitigate the land loss here in coastal Louisiana, which is amazing and awesome, not only for, um, to protect us from flooding here, but also for the wildlife that utilizes coastline. And the Coastal Wetland Planning, Protecting and Restoration Act of 1990 um, was a huge factor in this. We also see that barrier islands and berms have been um, prioritized since 2012 in, their, in the Coastal Master Plan that was um, made then. So a good reason for this is because these barrier islands are the first line of defense against any wave action and storm surges that we might see from the Gulf of Mexico. So just to give everyone a little bit of an idea on how restoration work, I've actually been out there in 2018 when they were restoring a uh, raccoon island, which is on the western side of southern Louisiana. And basically what happens is they lay out these massive pipes for miles long in an area, usually a sand shoal. And what they do is they pump all, like a lot of sediment. They try to get um, the island somewhere between three and six feet tall. And um, what they do is they pump all the sediment and you can think about it like you're frosting a cake. So think of the sediment as icing. So once you pump all the sediment onto the island, they use a ton of heavy machinery to smooth out the sediment. And just to give you all an example of what this looks like in real life, um, this is Queen Bess Island, which is about five-ish minutes off the coast of Grand Isle, that island, I mean, that, that town on stilts that I showed everyone earlier. And this is what Queen Bess looked like prior to this year, actually. So I was walking on this island for the last two years. And when I say walking, I really mean swimming. <laughs> so brown pelicans nested all throughout this island and I had to monitor them. So I had to go from one end of the island to the other and back again. Um, so I was beyond excited and happy that the brown pelicans, the terns, the skimmers, the oyster catchers had this awesome brand new habitat or not brand new, fixed habitat in order to breed on this year. And bonus, I didn't have to swim. <laughs> um, and this is what it looks like afterwards. And things that they added were these water breaks. And this is meant to just stop any like really harsh wave action from um, ruining the restoration. This is a little bit harder to see, but around the island, they dropped huge boulders of rocks in order to keep that sediment in place. And a couple um, other examples is Raccoon Island, which Raccoon Island doesn't have the rock wall barrier, but they have instead these massive breakwaters that restoration ecologists um, try, to, um, try to copy what would normally happen on these islands as sediment moves. So as you can see, they make these semicircles all across the um, southern portion of Raccoon Island. Another really important part of island restoration is planting vegetation. And the vegetation basically um, helps to keep the sediment in place, and the roots do. And not only that, but they also supply a ton of nesting material for the brown pelicans, which is always a plus. 
So just to give everyone a little bit of a background on the breeding population of brown pelicans that we have here in Louisiana, this is a graph taken from a paper by Selman et al. Um, in 2016, this was published, and it really shows how the cycles have ebbed and flow um, in terms of the brown pelican population. We actually saw the highest pelican population, or sorry, nesting, population occurring in 2005 at 17,215 nests. And just to give everyone a really quick reminder, in 05, Hurricane Katrina and Rita were pretty large that hit our coastline. There was also Ike and Gustav, in addition to oil spills such as Taylor in 04, and the one of the biggest, if not the biggest, oil spill um, in the United States, the Deepwater Horizon, that happened in 2010. So a lot of things have impacted the brown pelican population here, which is why we are no longer seeing the numbers as high as they used to be. And just to give everyone a little bit of what I see currently out there when I go out every single year, um, flooding. Flooding is something that we found in our preliminary um, analysis that causes mortality. It's the number one thing. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but this whole nest is flooded. The eggs are actually half underwater, which means they're no longer viable. And the second thing that we see that cause mortality is fishing line. Um, unfortunately, fishing line ends up really far offshore and we find rows of pelicans just stuck on the same fishing line quite often. And it's quite sad. Um, so this is a zoomed in image of the five different islands that I visit to study brown pelicans and there's a total of seven, I'm pretty sure, islands um, or areas in coastal Louisiana that currently have breeding populations of brown pelicans. And not all of these islands have been restored. And when I say restored, I mean they've had some human intervention, whether that be an addition of sediment or a rock wall or wait, uh, wait, wow, <laughs> water breaks. Um, and the ones that have the triangles on them, those are the islands that have been restored. So three out of the five islands that I study on have been restored, while the other two in Terrebonne Bay have not been restored. And this gives us a really cool uh, way to like compare the different island statuses, whether or not they've been restored. Um, one of the ways that I get to study brown pelicans is by using band resightings. And as you can see, the arrows are pointing to the bands. And this is what I would see when I'm out there in the field. Um, and we can utilize band resites because there's the very minimal disturbance. And we also have information on where these pelicans were initially banded. And even if, and if they were banded as chicks, we can tell how old they are now, which is so cool. I will say <laughs> doing band resites on pelicans is looking, is to me, it feels like I am looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> So this is what I normally, this is what I want to see when I go out there and I'm doing my band recites with my binoculars, with my camera, with my scope. I'm hoping to see this, an array of beautiful leg band colors. Unfortunately, more times than not, I like to call these pelicans rebel pelicans because they have somehow lost their color leg bands. So all I can see are these USGS metal bands, which don't help me because I can't see the numbers that are on them, unfortunately. So with the leg bands, we can actually find, we can get some insight um, on where do pelicans go when their islands are lost. Um, so prior to um, 2018, which is when I got here, there's, there were quite a few pelican breeding islands that were lost for example, Wine Island and Cat Island as a result of the Deepwater Horizon spill. So those pelicans normally go back to where they were born in order to raise their own chicks. Um, but then what happens when those islands are gone? We don't really know. So I'm hoping to just get a little bit of insight on that question. Occasionally, I get really lucky 
and my camera traps will actually get a banded pelican, which is awesome because like I said earlier, half the time, I really only see a metal band and no leg bands because they like to be rebels out there. And talking about camera traps, this is another way that I monitor the pelican population here in coastal Louisiana. And this is a great way to also decrease disturbance while we're in the colony because we wouldn't want to disturb them. And if you were a pelican, you probably wouldn't want me to disturb your nesting season either. And these cameras, I'm utilizing these pictures in order to get some insight on how successful these nests are across the different islands, um, whether or not they've been restored or they haven't been restored compared to island size. How big are these islands? Is island size having any effect on how the nests are doing throughout the season? Something else that we can find out from the cameras and the photos that we get is how, what the daily survival rate is of chicks. We can also see how often they're being fed, if they're being predated, if flooding is causing the mortality, which is something that we did see. And just to give everyone a little bit of an example of what I see on an almost daily basis, because I have 5 million images, <laughs> uh, which is a lot. And don't ask me how I'm going through them. I'm crying as I'm going through. Just kidding. Um, but we're getting through all 5 million um, by subsampling. And you can see um, all, all the nests here. There's four nests and they each get their own individual numbers. And we can see there's two chicks in each nest, which is really great because then we can keep tabs on each chick and we can see if they fledge or not. Um, something else that we can see from these camera traps is provisioning rates. So when brown pelicans are feeding their chicks, they open their pouch and um, the chicks basically will get fish that is regurgitated. And we can see that happening in all of these circles. Something else that we can see um, with the photos is any disturbance, whether that's the same species disturbance, different species disturbance. We can also gain things like, are they preening and how long they're preening for? As we can see, these birds are preening here. Um, oh, sorry about that. Something else that's really cool is we can see, and I was not expecting this, but this photo was taken during um, Hurricane Barry last year. And this gives us an insight of what pelicans do when there is a hurricane hitting them. So this pole right here on the left, uh, on the right hand side is about four feet tall. And there is about two, two and a half feet of sitting water just on top of this breeding island. So normally, all of this dark colored stuff is not here. This is normally land that I walk on when I go and change out my cameras. And that was really cool to see. And I'm really glad that my cameras did not get flooded. Something else that we look at um, when we're out here in the breeding colony is vegetation. I'm interested in looking at the vegetation diversity. And this includes how many different species are out there on islands that have been restored and islands that have not been restored. I take measurements such as maximum height of the vegetation in any given plot. Also, what percentage of the island has vegetation on it? Um, we're also collecting samples in order to measure like how um, what the dry weight is of the vegetation during our plots, and we're using a line transect to do so. Um, another important part here in Louisiana is elevation. These islands are not very tall, so keeping tabs on how they're changing throughout time is really important, not only to help potentially inform managers and the people in charge of restoration on how they could benefit wildlife while also benefiting humans in the future, we like to just get all of our characteristics and measurements taken. These are my two awesome field techs, UL undergrads that I've since graduated that helped me out for a season, and they're taking the elevation samples. Okay, so the next part of my dissertation work is a little more invasive, even though I try to stay in the non-disturbing ways of sampling. We put GPS tags on five adult brown pelicans. 
throughout the breeding season in order to better understand how often are they coming back to the nest and taking care of their chicks. So we're using GPS tags and camera traps to get like the full story basically on like where these hogs are going, how often are they coming back. I was also interested to see if they were using restored marshes. So we know that they're using restored barrier islands. We don't really know if they're using these restored marshes, which tend to be more stable and may or may not have more fish in them. And in case you're wondering, um, this is my collaborator, Brock Geary. He is weighing the adult brown pelican. And how you do that is you take a tent bag and a luggage scale. And of course, you have to have a permit to do so. And in case you didn't believe me that there was a pelican in that bag, there was. And this is what um, the adult brown pelican looks like with its telemetry tag. It doesn't look too happy, but no worries. I actually re-spotted this individual this year and it is doing pretty well. So just to give everyone a little bit of an example of what areas have had marsh restoration, um, everything in the green has been restored. Um, it restored marshlands. And just to give a little bit more of an um, information, I was wondering how much time are they spending in the marsh habitat, specifically those um, that have been restored. So for example, if 80% of the marsh habitat hasn't been restored, I expect them to be in those areas 80% of the time versus 20% of the time in restored areas. And our preliminary results show that they're not really utilizing the restored marshes um, in the same proportions that we thought they would be. Um, each of these colors represents one adult brown pelican throughout the breeding season and where they moved. And it's really cool because they actually don't overlap. Um, but we found that they didn't really utilize the uh, marshes. And just to give everyone a little bit more of an insight into some of our early findings here in Louisiana and our brown pelicans. So we found that um, there were higher hatch success on restored islands. So these, restore, these islands are restored mainly to protect the coastline. They're not necessarily restored to help pelicans out. So to find out that they're potentially doing better on these restored islands is great and something that we expect to see because these islands are more stable and they're just, they, they are not getting flooded as often because they're built up higher. We also found that restored island has increased nest success, which means we see brown pelican chicks fl fledging more often on restored islands. So they make it to the age where they have their down feathers, they can keep themselves warm, and they've left the nest. Um, and that's what we considered fledging, when we no longer see them, but we know that they're old enough that they could survive on their own. And they even form what I call teenager groups or crushes, and they just hang out with each other versus being on their nests. So I, we also found, yeah, so we found more chicks that fledge on restored islands. And this is a photo of fledglings that were um, taken last year. And I thought it would be fun to share with everyone our fieldwork mishaps because I get asked, all the time if things go wrong, and they go wrong all the time. Um, so for example, I'm driving up on the boat to this island, and the last thing you wanna see is a 16 pound adult brown pelican on your itty bitty camera trap. It probably means the camera is no longer in focus, the camera is no longer pointing at what I wanted it to point at, and now I've lost two weeks worth of data. So unfortunately, this does happen uh, a little bit throughout the field season. Um, apparently camera traps are great places for brown pelicans to perch on. We also, unfortunately, can't always boat up to an island. So sometimes we have to take a kayak out there. 
And occasionally the winds are not in our favor. So for us to get back to our boat, which is what that arrow is pointing at, takes longer than what we expect it to take. And you just spin. The kayak just spins in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and you have to try real hard to get back to the boat. Um, something else that happens quite often, and I'm gonna let you watch this video of me struggling to free my camera trap of seabird poop. Oh, where is my? So I'm using my needle nose pliers that I would normally use for banding to try and free this camera. It's literally glued together by some seabird poop. So fun times out there. <laughs> um, and I go back home and I scrub the camera with a toothbrush and some water because I need to reuse it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have an unlimited supply of camera traps here. Something else that happens quite often is fire ants will colonize our lovely camera okay, traps. You stay in the bag. Camera traps have been hijacked by these ants. Oh no, it's on me. There's one on me. <laughs> and me and my lovely lab mate, Paige, uh, stumbled upon this camera trap that was covered in ants. And if you've never been stung by fire ants, I don't recommend it. It does feel like your um, this thing is on fire. So not as much fun as just hanging out with pelicans. Okay. And... The good old, my boat will not start, has happened quite a few times. This is us being rescued by Louisiana Fish and uh, Wildlife and Fisheries. A huge shout out to them for giving us a tow because we were in the Gulf of Mexico for about an hour and a half with a dead engine. And that's me. I probably look really sad in that photo. So um, I get this question a lot as well is, um, how is it to capture a pelican? Um, it's not as painless as one might think. I actually have um, t-shirt straps wrapped around my index fingers because their, their beaks are actually serrated. So it'll actually cut into your finger while you're trying to put the GPS tags on them. And on top of that, I am covered in poop. So this is what it looks like to be a field biologist here in coastal Louisiana. I wanted to talk about um, the impacts of tropical storms and storm surges and hurricanes and things like that because I feel like not a lot of people get a firsthand insight or look at what really happens to our coastline, um, especially to the birds that utilize this coastline to breed on. Um, so tropical storm Cristobal actually hit this year, 2020, um, June 1st, and it dissipated on June 11th. And I actually went out there um, June 13th, and Eastern Louisiana was hit really hard, including Queen Bess Island, which I showed earlier. Queen Bess was that island that was restored. Um, and we saw quite the damage out there, including dead spoonbills, which I had never seen one before. Um, the tern and skimmer colony was hit pretty bad. I looked for any surviving chicks and eggs, and I did not see any, as well as my two um, volunteers for the day. We could not find any. This is what the aftermath looked like. There were eggs everywhere. Um, good news though, they did rebound and I believe that there were some chicks that made, uh, made it the second round. So something that I wasn't expecting to have happened after um, Tropical Storm Cristobal was that there was a lot of land movement. Um, I'm about five feet, seven inches. And this is me next to my camera trap pole, which is about five, a little over five feet tall. And this is what it looked like after Tropical Storm Cristobal. It's about two and a half feet tall. So it got buried about two and a half feet, which is wild. Um, my lab mate isn't even standing next to it because it was buried that deep. So just to give everyone another um, perspective on how much this land moves um, after tropical, this, this was just a tropical storm, it wasn't even a hurricane. All that dark material is called peat. And I, would, I estimated about 10 feet of peat was exposed and that the tropical storm had moved all of that land um, elsewhere.
So to end on a positive note, I think we can all do our part in helping brown pelicans on a coastline. So I, my field sites are anywhere from five minutes off the coast to an hour um, off our coastline. And this was actually found on Raccoon Island, which is about 30 kilometers off the mainland. And we can see here that the brown pelican decided to use this really large plastic sheet to line its nest which is mind blowing to me um, to have seen that in real life. But I see shampoo bottles, I see paper clips, you name it, I probably have seen it on the island. And if we all can make sure that our trash ends up in the, in the trash can, this could help the island keep it pristine as well as help out the wildlife that utilize these spaces. And I hope that these pelicans are here and thriving for many generations to come. And they're really resilient. And with our help, they can really make it. And we, because it's our state bird, of course, we don't wanna see them go extinct again. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who helps help me out on this project, the volunteers, the undergrads, my collaborators, my committee members who all came out there. Um, they were awesome rock stars and thank them a lot. And I wanna thank everyone for coming today and listening to me um, geek out about brown pelicans, which I can do all day, every day. And with that, I'll take any questions. You can also feel free to email me or follow me on social media. I'm not sure if there's questions. Hey, I was trying to turn my own video back on. Oh. <laughs> and I loved seeing the um, field woe photos because um, it takes me back to my time on the barrier islands and we experienced many similar situations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I'm checking around for. Uh, Question. Katie, I sent a chat question. Luke, I saw yours, so let me go ahead and read. Luke Laborde was asking, do you have an idea what the current population growth trajectory in your survey areas um, of Louisiana or Louisiana are? And he's curious how pelicans are responding to coastal erosion and sea level rise. Yeah, so um, Louisiana Wildlife and Fishery actually do almost annual aerial surveys in order to estimate how many nests there are. So they'll actually take photos of the islands and then someone will go in and count every nest. And for each nest, they are assuming that there are two adult brown pelicans out there. I actually don't have the most recent data because it belongs to them. Um, but it's, it's about like, 12,000, I think I last saw breeding pairs. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It's somewhere up there, like the tens of thousands, um, like between 10,000 and like 15,000 brown pelican nesting pairs. And, and the second question was, sorry. Just curious about the response to uh, coastal erosion and sea level rise. Yeah, so the response hasn't been like, terrible but we actually don't know a lot we know that if the island is stable the pelicans will keep coming back to the island and um breeding because we recite the same bands over the same lake bands over and over again but our frequency on how often we recite the bands is actually pretty low so it's about like less than five percent of the bands we will re-see um, once they've been banded. So we're not sure if the pelicans have left the population entirely or that they died. Um, some of them do migrate. It depends on any given year. Um, the individual that migrated last year may not decide to migrate this year. Um, and all of that's, that, all that stuff is actually just not well studied because it costs so much money to put a telemetry tag on a pelican. Um, Juita, relative to bands, early on, Liz asked if you could explain why your color bands were not remaining affixed. Yeah, 
I actually have, so the way that the color bands work is that they just wrap around the leg. It's not like the metal band where they clasp together. Also metal is pretty hard to like um, open once I put it on there. I would be really surprised if a Pelican would lose a metal band versus um, the plastic band, which is way easier to bend. Um, so if it gets snagged on something, the, the plastic band will most likely just fling off. Um, they're not really rebel pelicans. We just like to call them that to make ourselves feel better every time we see one of them. <laughs> okay, sticking to migration for the ones that do migrate, do you know where they go? So as far as we know is they go into Central America, all the way down to Honduras. Um, my committee member, who is Jul whose name is Juliet Lamb, she actually put a bunch of GPS tracks on them um, during her dissertation work, and she found that they went all the way down into Central America. Um, Jim Boutte wanted to say great talk as well as several other people and how much they love your enthusiasm, which I completely agree. Aw, thank you. <laughs> so will you conduct another field season and maintain this level of enthusiasm? Yes, so I'm so sad. Um, I actually start my field season in February of every year. So this, this past February, I went out there, put all my camera traps up, I did my leg band surveys, and then COVID happened. And the university shut me down. I had 35 cameras out in the Gulf of Mexico for three months. They, event they all died because they're only taking lithium batteries. Um, so they all died out there. And then I was permitted to go back out at the end of May. So I have this huge data gap <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually really excited to have my final and fourth field season out there with the Brown Pelicans. And I'm hoping this season will just you know, I'll have an actual full season and the university won't shut down again. All right, let me see. Um, so that is exciting. I'm glad that hopefully, well, hope that everything goes well next season. Um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> let me go ahead and read Liz's question. She's intrigued by the patterns of adult pelicans with transmitters on the unrestored coastal areas. They appear so territorial. Um, and, and then she was just went on to say, keep up the good work with the pelicans on the restored areas. Um, and she looks forward to future research. But anything to add there? Yeah, so um, my collaborator, Brock Geary, is actually doing the preliminary um, analysis of that. But just to give everyone a little sneak peek, it's probably more because they're trying to do some sort of resource partitioning. So if they all hunt in the same area, there's not gonna be enough fish for all of them. So they're sticking to their own little sections, um, probably because they're following the food resources. So we're really excited to see what comes out of that paper because he's also utilizing data from the Menhaden fisheries and layering that with our um, GPS transmitter data. So it's gonna be really cool. I'm excited for that paper. <laughs> Um, well, maybe we'll have him come on. Yes, you should. <laughs> a subsequent presentation. Uh, Marty Floyd, relative to banding, added that for red-tailed hawks, the colored bands are glued. Um, it's just the overlap. They're not oh. glued to the bird's leg. Um, hawk, hawks can still remove them, and the metal bands are also designed different, so they are not pulled off. Just an that's a good one. I should start um, gluing those leg bands. So actually the photos that I've shown you of the leg bands, those are not from my lab. They're from various different other um, labs and projects and people. Um, so yeah, that might be a thing that has to happen. <laughs> We're just going to start gluing pelican leg bags, um, colored leg bags on. That's awesome. Didn't even think about that. All right. Uh, let's see. Someone is asking, when will you complete your dissertation and when do you hope to graduate with your PhD? Oh gosh, <laughs> I feel like that's a loaded question. We are well, you can let everybody know what you're going through right now. 
Yeah, I'm sure. actually going through um, comprehensive exams at this very moment that we were speaking. I'm doing my written comprehensive exams and I feel like I'm failing. So <laughs> um, my current plan is to graduate December of 2022 because I decided to be the oddball and start my PhD program in the spring unlike everyone else who typically starts in the fall. So <laughs> my graduation date's a little off. <laughs> um, we did, if you ever wanna discuss more with Marty Floyd, he dropped his email in the comments uh, relative to gluing and on colored leg bands, but I will also save the chat and I can get that to you. I think I have, is, am I still screen sharing? No, okay, oh yeah, I am, uh, okay, I have to stop screen sharing to see the chat. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. <laughs> um, here's one that I was also curious about. So Charles Williams just asked, what are the main predators and what is the nest loss rate from predation specifically? If you know yet. Yeah, so, so far I've gone through um, 2018's data and we actually didn't see any predation. Um, it was, lit flooding was the number one cause of mortality. If they were to be predated on, it would probably be laughing gulls um, unless they were nesting on the ground, which doesn't happen too often across the islands. They do tend to nest on either marsh elder or black mangrove, which means they're elevated and the nutria are less likely to get to them, especially if there's turns and skimmers around and the turns and skimmers come out there in numbers. So just easier to prey on those than to prey on um, brown pelicans. But yeah, so far, no predation. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It just happened, we haven't caught it on our cameras. Mm -hmm. So are all of the pelican nests elevated in vegetation or any of them on the ground? Yeah, there are definitely some on the ground. Um, typically, the pelicans that arrive later, so mid to late March, all the good spots, so the spots on the shrubs, um, tend to be all taken up. So then the pelicans will start to nest on the ground. But they're also really good at defending their nests. Um, it takes a lot to flush them. Um, even for me, which is how we actually catch them. Sometimes they just, they refuse to leave their nest and we are able to catch adults that way and put tags on them. Um, but yeah, they do nest on the ground too. So what were the other species that you were seeing on the same islands nesting? We have, oh my gosh, okay. There's quite a few tern species, and now I'm trying to remember. We have sandwich terns, we have royal <laughs> terns, we have Caspian terns, <laughs> we have the black skimmers, we have this roseate spoonbills, black crowned night herons, American oyster catchers. Is that the one that we have here in Louisiana? Yes. I think that's the species. Yeah. Yeah. American oyster catchers. Um, we also have uh, the, we have tricolored her herons, tricolored herons. You don't have to name all of them. <laughs> yeah, we have a bunch of parents and egrets out there too. So it's quite a show to like get. To, I feel very honored and blessed to get to see all of these birds nesting and seeing all the chicks running around. <laughs> so then, are you or anybody else studying or monitoring that success for the other species as well? Yeah, so um, my lab mate is actually monitoring all the turns and skimmers. She's also using camera traps. We're doing that, very similar things with different species. So she's doing camera Paige? traps. And, no, it's Andrea Santarello. Okay, Take, taking notes <laughs> <laughs> on our presenters. <laughs> Uh, Marty Floyd was also just pointing out that for ground nesters, um, other predators tend to be coyotes and raccoons. Um, but then this is also why birds oh. nest on islands, um, that predators would have to swim a distance to get, to get there. And then some of these storm events will also take some of those predators out as well. Yeah, and the irony is the raccoon island is the largest nesting um, island for brown pelicans, but there are no raccoons on there. There's also no coyotes on there, but the island right next to Raccoon Island, which is called Whiskey Island, um, 
actually has um, coyotes on it. Interesting. Um, so is anybody actually removing coyotes or predators? Do you know? They have removed coyotes, but I haven't heard of them removing it since the restoration on whiskey ended in 2018. Okay, I've been trying to keep up with all of the chat, so I don't think I've overlooked any questions so far there. Apologies if I have. Um, Anyone I can email me. I love chatting about power hugging. Well, right. So, Juita, you did have your contact information up on that last slide if you wanted to say it, say it again or show it again. Um, yeah, I'll everybody who does want to or to put it in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing questions come through, and I think my stream on the Baton Rouge Audubon Society Facebook uh, page is active and current, so I apologize if I'm missing anything there, but I just haven't seen any comments pop up there. Um, will you name... <laughs> name the terns again oh name maybe the species that you that were also on the island or islands i just typed it in <laughs> in case anyone wanted to know it's typed okay. in the chat <laughs> okay so sweet so juita has included her email in the chat for anybody who would like to reach out with additional questions once we cut this off in a few more minutes oh i have not seen any falcons out there we have seen a brown booby out there. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Very cool. Interesting that you haven't seen any other falcons though. Yeah. Uh, and you added, okay, so sandwich turns, royal turns, Caspian turns. All right, you guys. I mean, we are closing in right on time. Um, Julita, thank you so much for graciously agreeing to do this while you are going through comps right now. Um, so we do sincerely appreciate it. And with that, I will, um, I will close it down, but I will try to save this chat first. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was an awesome break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now back to studying and analysis. Yes. <laughs> I know you have terabytes full of photos. So yeah, so many. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.